Hey, how's everyone doing this morning? Good. You'll have to uh, forgive our media tech people this morning. One of ours was not able to come this morning, so they're a little strapped for uh, for help up there. Uh, but I, th I know everything's going to be all right. Uh, Stay with us as we begin to worship. This 
everyone here today. And I'm excited about our visitors. I'm excited about our members. We are so glad that you chose to be here today. And you know what? I know you came expecting God to show up in your life today. Amen? And we're here today to come and to worship Him. Because He is worthy to be worshipped. And He is worthy to be praised. And as we begin our service today, uh, as, we, uh, as, we, as, we, as we begin our service, let's begin in prayer, okay? Father, again we come in Jesus' name. The name is above every name. And Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who came willingly... He led a life, a life without sin. There was no sin found in him. But he was made to be sin for each one of us. And he gave his life that we might have eternal life, abundant life, the joy of our salvation, Lord. It just bubbles up, God, when we get together. And Father, I'm so thankful, God, for, for the joy that you have set in our heart today. And so, Father, we thank you for allowing us to be in your house today. We thank you, God, for, Lord, I believe it's a new beginning. I believe this is a new day, a new start, God, a new chance to come into your house and to worship you, God. And, God, we are just, uh, we just want you to do everything that needs to be done in our life, Father. Bless our church. Bless our people, Father, and those that are sick and those that are hurting, Lord. Lord, we just give you praise today. Thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue.
Amen, church. Is our God able? There is nothing our God cannot do. And, and church, I want to encourage you this morning because I know it's been a couple of weeks since since our interim Wayne Dorset has has left us. But I want to reassure you, our deacons are working hard, and they are working to find the pastor that God is bringing to us. Um, I know we haven't seen much, but I, I can guarantee you they are working. And we need to have patience and wait for God. If we rush this, things could get worse than they are. That's just my humble opinion, so take that for what it is. But let's sing this next song, Standing on the Promises, in light of that. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for these promises that you have given to us in your word. Father, I do pray that we as a church would stand on your promises that you will never leave us or forsake us, and that you are working everything out for good, Father. We just pray for Pastor Jim 
this morning as he brings the message, that you would uh, lead, guide him, and direct him, and that every word that he says is an overflow of his time with you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Well, amen. I want you to look to your left. Look to your right. You see somebody close to you? Give them a shout out. Give them a raise that hand and say hello. Love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. Amen. Listen, uh, I got just a couple of announcements, quick announcements real quick here. I got some something from the association that if any, anybody is interested in going on the West Virginia trip, I have an application here. I have all the specifics. If you'd like information there, uh, we have them, okay? Also, I got, a, I got a card here, and it says, For your kind, thoughtful expression of sympathy is deeply, deeply appreciated and gratefully acknowledged. The family of Eugene William Gerlach. And there's a little note in here. She says, Dear Fort Creek Baptist Church, Gideons. Uh, please, uh, uh, let's see here, I convey a thank you to the person or persons at Fort Creek for the Gideon Bibles that were sent in memory of Gene Gerlach, Sr. Uh, it was appreciated and honored. Uh, keep up the great work, sincerely, Miss Ruth Gerlach and all the family. Just wanted to mention that. Also wanted to mention that if you didn't get a bulletin there, the bulletins were back there. We need to, uh, today is a new day. Uh, praise God, we're coming back together for Sunday morning service, a Sunday evening service, a Bible study in between. And somebody asked me the other day, I said, I had told them all this, and they said, well, what about Sunday school? I said, well, Sunday school is Bible study. And so we're going to have Bible study in between, kind of thing like that. And listen, uh, we have been having about seven different classes that's been out here, kind of thing like that. Some of the classes will be going back to a room, okay? So you get with your teacher, kind of thing like that. And we have uh, sanitary uh, things to put out that you can, uh, teachers that you can take care of your room with, that you can help sanitize and all. And there are masks for each room, okay? So let's try to uh, let's try to keep up with that, and let's try to take care of all that. Amen. All right. Well, praise God. Are we ready? All right. Now and then, an old friend of mine I've not seen for some time. We'll stop by and he'll ask me, where have I been? What's been on my mind? They wonder. Still painting this old town red. I tell them I'm serving Jesus now, and the old man is dead. And the man you see before you.
such a wicked life. I had no hope inside. I was lost and in darkness, searching for the light. And then one night in a little church, I'm glad I've been saved, amen? I'm glad I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I know that I don't know what a day holds for myself, nor do you. But I know that God holds me in the palm of His hands, amen? He has inscribed us, the Bible says, in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16, that He has inscribed us on His very palm, on His hand. God knows where we're at. God knows what we're going through. And God loves each one of us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want us to start off today with a special prayer for Ben. Matt, could I get you to come for a minute? Could I get you to stand right up here for me? Okay. Oh, well, let's, uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer right now. And just, uh, we want to uh, stand in for for Ben, and we want to pray, okay? Could we just, uh, let's just pray. Let's just have a word of prayer for Ben. Father, God, we come to you in Jesus' name, and, and we thank you, God, for your wonderful love. We thank you for your commitment, Lord. We thank you uh, back in the Word of God where it says that you took those stripes for our healing. And, Lord, as we come before your throne today, Right here on this Sunday morning, the 7th of February, 2000, uh, 2021, God, Father, we ask right now, Father, as humbly as we can come to you, we ask for, uh, we ask on, on behalf of our brother, our loved one, Ben, Father, we lift him up to you, and we ask for your blessings on his life. We ask you, Father, to touch him, Lord. Father, we realize that he's had some surgeries and there's going to be some more, God. But, Father, where he's at right now, Lord, would you just, uh, Father, just wrap your loving arms around him and, and just let him know that there are people at the church right now that are praying for him, God, that are lifting him up. And not only today, not only right now, but, God, as we come, Father, we pray, and we consistently pray for our brother. We love Ben, Father, and we love you. And, Father, we ask that your will would be done, but we ask for healing along the path, Father, and we ask for good days. Father, your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, this is probably going to be a short message, you know, uh, I had a message that I had sent to, 
I send the message to Brother Chris and, and Lacey uh, uh, weekly, and I try to have that done by Wednesday. And uh, I send it also to Miss Margie because she needs to know uh, beforehand what Brother Jim is going to be up here or anybody is going to be up here preaching on so she'll be able to study the words and be able to, uh, the sign language and all that and all. So, uh, but, uh, so we're going to be looking at, and I changed this actually Friday, and I was up till Saturday morning sometime, the wee hours of the morning, with this because God just, God just changed it. He changed it. Now, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, folks. Look to somebody to close to you there, say it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God's Word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. And I'll tell you, God's Word is encouraging to me. God's Word is encouraging to you. You know, the reason that we're not so much encouraged and we're discouraged is because the enemy is a discourager. He is. And he is trying his best to discourage you and I. Well, I want us to look at chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at those first 15 verses right there, okay? And the Bible says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with, with the fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to give to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you, sir, for your wonderful word. We thank you for your wonderful promises, God. And we thank you, God, for allowing us, Father, to be able to, to live and, Father, to serve you today. This day, Father, the yesterday is past and tomorrow is not here, but God, this is the day. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be in your house today, and we ask that your will would be done in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. It was advised that the devil was going to put up his tools for sale. On the date of the sale, the tools were placed for public inspection, each being marked with a sale price. Um, there were a treacherous lot of implements, hatred, envy, jealous, doubt, lying, pride, and so on and so forth. Laid on the rest of the pile was a harmless-looking tool, well-worn and priced very high. The name of the tool asked one of the purchasers, what is it? And oh, the adversary said, oh, that's discouragement. Why have you priced it so high? Well, it's because it's more useful to me than the other tools. You see, I can pry open and get inside a person's heart with that particular one. When I can't get in or get close, this tool will allow me to get in. Now, once I get inside, I can make him do exactly what I choose. It's a badly worn tool because I use it on almost everyone, since few people know it belongs to me. The devil's price for discouragement was so high that he never sold it. It is still the major tool that the enemy uses on you and I today. As I mentioned last week from the pulpit here, how that all churches or in a state of, well, not everybody is able to come back right now to church. I know that, hey, listen, we have a lot of church members, and I know that we pray for each other. But I know that from talking to some, like I talked to Miss Cornelia the other day, and old brother Jim, how I want to come back, and it's been so long, and, and recently had surgery on her, you know, had surgery there, and, and, so, and, and so, but she wants to come back. Well, people have got, we've gotten discouraged, and I know the church has. You know, why don't I see happy folks anymore? Why don't I see smiles anymore? Why don't I see joy in the hearts of people anymore? Well, in these days, we live, and, and so much has changed from day to day. From the virus, it has changed the way uh, people get together, the way we socialize, the way that we stay in touch, and the fear that has gripped people because of all that's going on. The uncertainty has not only brought this new disease, but our family members have been, had to go to the hospital. And a lot of us couldn't be close to our family members as they went to the hospital. And some of our family members said, God has called them on home to glory. And we, weren't, we was not even able to be with them. Many jobs have been lost, as well as businesses have gone down. Our travel and our freedom that we have enjoyed, it seems like we're so limited as to what we can do right now. Even our rights as Americans, the First and Second Amendment, things are being cut away even as we live from day to day. The Christian values that we hold so dear uh, for many years are slowly eroding fast in this past year. 
if this wasn't bad enough, the election came and went, in which people feel uh, like the election was certainly rigged, and we know that our country is headed in, the fa in a fast way, in a fast pace, in the wrong direction. With so much debt and socialistic ideas, lawlessness that seems to be everywhere, with a group of folks that even wants to get rid of law enforcement. I was visiting someone yesterday, and uh, I was at their house, and they were sharing with me how that they see uh, people around in the neighborhood in the wee hours they should be home. And they're, they're out there, and, and they call the law, and they even the local law enforcement, and the law enforcement several times. I know that he mentioned to me about three times how that the local, even the local law enforcement is like, well, just kind of turning their head, just kind of saying, well, oh, well, is, you know, nothing's going to happen. Well, I don't know why we have to wait till somebody gets injured, somebody gets hurt, or somebody gets killed before somebody does something, you know. Well, that's the time that we're living in. The country that we live so dear, we're headed in a fast pace in the wrong way, no doubt. Uh, uh, and with an increased and the lack of love for Almighty God and His creation and His laws and His commands, our country, we the people, the church, Christians, we have a great responsibility. We have a great responsibility. Men, you have a great responsibility to your wife to be the head of the house, to love God with all of your heart, to make sure that your children are raised up in a Christ-like home. We as Christians have a responsibility to, to the nation that we live in. God has put us here. He has put us in this place to be a light, to be a light in this dark world. And as you know, because nobody in here, nobody in this place right here is a probably, probably not even a baby Christian. You've been seasoned for a while, and you know maybe even what the, what the Bible says towards the end of the book. The times are going to get bad. But we have a big responsibility to our nation. There is something that we can do. And people tell me, well, all I can do is pray. That is a major thing that we should be doing, church, is praying and believing. I mean, if fasting is in there, if God calls you to fast, not only pray, but fast. Give something up. Pray for our nation. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 is so plain, if my people. That's talking to not only the nation of Israel, but we can certainly apply that to our life. If my people, which are called by his name, that's us. We, can, we need to repent of our sins, don't you think? Our time is short here on this earth, but we can make a difference. We can walk the walk of Jesus. We can show his great love. We can tell folks about salvation in Christ. We can make calls maybe, and I, you know, make calls sometimes to our governor our legislators, things like that. We can do that. And whether it makes a difference or not, are we taking the time to try to even make a, a telephone call? It's kind of, as my son-in-law, Chris Johns, as he comes over, and y'all know Chris, most of y'all know Chris, they come to my house and it's always, it's always politics and it's always about things about going on, you know, and stuff like that. And you know what? You know what? I have to just get, I get tired of hearing it. I don't even watch the news much anymore. I don't. But you know what? Uh, you know, that stuff right there can drag a person down. And that's exactly what the enemy is doing. He's dragging not only the world down and, and everything the way that it's going, but he's dragging you and I, the believers, down. He's put something there that we, the enemy has put something there that we certainly don't like, and we see and we know, we know, 
Somebody I talked to uh, this week also said, did, Jim, did you hear? Uh, did you hear on the news there uh, something about putting the conservatives out of the military? I said, no, I have not heard that. Uh, you know what? But, you know, there again, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to spend my time in the Word of God. And I'll just tell you this. If we're spending our time watching six or eight hours of TV and things like that, and we're getting down and out, well, you're going to be down and out. You know, where you're going to be encouraged is when you start getting back into the Word of God, when you start praying and when you start seeking Him with all of your heart. When we start repenting of our sin because we are sinners. Saved by the wonderful grace of God. We are. We can make these calls. Our nation about 200, what is it, 243, 245 years old. Our nation that, we're, that we love, our country, was established as a Christian nation. And it's only been just a relatively short time when we think about that when we think about how old, when I was over in Europe over there in the military, over there and just thinking about the age of that place as compared to America, you know. Wow, America is young. The church or the people in the church have been jarred. People wondering. And I see the signs, faith over fear. And will the church family come back? Will they come back? Or some think the government may say, well, they're going to mandate sometimes that you can't even get together. We don't know what a day holds. And some people are going to be out of church so long, it seems like, uh, and they don't have a great close connection to the Lord, and they may be knocked out of church for the rest of their life. Isn't that terrible? Let's not forget what the Bible says, okay? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the Bible says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see, what? The day approaching. Guess what? Uh, when the times get rough, when things get really tough, oh, when you, when you feel like I can't do this anymore, oh, the, the easy way out, there's no easy way out. We have, to, we have to get right with God. We have to call on Him, and we have to ask God for help. What has happened? Will it ever be the same again? Listen, church, I feel your struggle. I feel your pain. Listen, do you feel my pain coming from my point of view? When I look out to the congregation or when I, when I see, you know, it's, it's, it, seems like, it seems like we get knocked out of joint so easily. We get knocked out of place so easily. But we're in a war. It's a real war. It's a spiritual battle. And the enemy is not, is not for you. He's trying to hurt you. He's trying to knock you out of church. So goes the family. So goes the church. So goes the nation. Amen. I feel your pain. I feel your, I feel your lack of joy. I feel it. I feel your discouragement. In a time where we're under attack by the enemy from all sides because his time is coming to a close, he is using all of his weapons. Oh, I want to walk around so bad, but I know I need to stay put. Wow. You know, I can preach better, I think. Well, I, I'm just saying, I, when I get away and just, and just preach. I thank God. I thank God for for what God is doing in my life in these days. You know what? I could be discouraged. My wife has not been able to be here in church with me for some time. I could be discouraged, you know, and I could say, well, you know, I, I see my friends, 
My friends are leaving just like this. My friends are leaving. I know that as a responsibility of I'm not the, I'm not the senior pastor here. I'm, I'm just the so associate pastor here. But there's so much responsibility and so much that falls upon. Do you see it from my direction? I love you all. And I want to see the best for each one of us. If I knew that I had, if I had something going on with a virus or whatever stuff like that, boy, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even chance coming. And I said, you know what, Lord, that may happen sometime. It may be on Saturday night or whatever. I don't know, but you know what, I may have to give uh, Brother Matt a call, Brother Kevin a call, and say, Brother Kevin, guess what, I got this stuff, and and uh, you're going to be in the pulpit, I guess. Uh, Amen. Praise God. I pray that God's gonna, God's gonna, God's gonna take care of us. Hey, hey listen, He hadn't brought you this far to just let you linger to say, "Hey, you can make it the rest of the way on, on your own." You know, uh, He hadn't brought us that. He hadn't, He hadn't done that to us. But I, I feel your pain. In many ways, our lesson today. In many ways, our lesson today about Moses. You know, I went back and looked over some of some of my past messages, and I, I've got probably more messages that I have in, in the past years have done than I have on anybody else. I don't know why that is. I love the Old Testament. I love the New Testament. But I love to go back, and I love to reacquaint myself with what God did right there in those days. When Moses was being used by God, when God called Moses, amen, our, our lesson today, we see Moses presented with the same dilemma that we're in today. His life is about to be jarred. Our life has been jarred, much like Americans. His life was safe. His life was predictable, and he possessed a family, and he was married to Zipporah, the daughter of the priest of Midian, and for the first time in his life since miraculously growing up in Pharaoh's courts and escaping sure death as an infant, Moses was settled, and he was happy with his life. Now, I try to every once in a while. I'm not the bearer of bad news all the time. But I try to assure my family once in a while, what happens if? Because we don't know. There's unknowns, uncertainties that we happen, that happen to us about our life. I mean, we could have a sickness. I mean, we could have things that happen financially, you know, people could be knocked out of a paycheck and be outside in the cold, like our church family at, uh, at 12th Street. By the way, we were having a good time down that way and uh, still, still moving right along. But uh, we see Moses' life. Think about him. He had a, a kind of a happy life out there watching, taking care of his animals, out there living. And then, and then one day, he happens to look over and he happens to see something. It was God that intervened in Moses' life. While Moses was tending the livestock, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. Moses saw all oh, that that through the bush there, that though it was on fire, the bush did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and I'll take a closer look. This is kind of strange. This is kind of strange. Why does this bush burn? And why doesn't the bush burn up? So Moses got a little closer. Well, to Moses' surprise, God had a word for him. 
God was pulling him in, getting him a little bit closer because he had something to share with Moses. Now, before this, of course, Moses was interested in what he's seen, but he had not been told where it starts in there about verse number 10. And the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, verse number 8, and I have come down. God has come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to the land and to a good land, a large land, flowing with milk and honey unto the place of all these that are there the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the uh, Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. Most, or maybe Moses, must have been ecstatic at this time. He must have been ecstatic at this point. That is, until he heard out of the Lord's mouth, out of God's mouth, the next decree that he made he said to Moses, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Well, God, I, you know, th this is me. I mean, I can't do this. I mean, I, I can find every excuse in the book, can't you? And we do. I can find every excuse in the book why I don't do this anymore. I can find every excuse in the book why I'm not going out witnessing anymore i can find any excuse and and moses was moses was at that point god do you know who you're talking to here i mean my goodness you see now moses's life is about to be shook up what if god called you scott what if god called you on the mission field what if god called you what if God called you to, to pastor a church? What if God called you to be a Sunday school teacher? What if God called you to be a discipleship teacher? Would you say, well, God, you got the wrong person here. That's what Moses was trying to tell God. I can't do this. I can't do it. And do you know what? I can't do what I'm doing right here. It's only by the grace and mercy of God that I'm able to stand before you and try to articulate anything. It's by the grace of God that he gives what we need. God does. He's a good God. He's a great God. And he knows what we're going through. He will not let you down. And one day, one day we'll be before him. And I and you want to hear him say, well done, amen, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well, so the commissioning was given by God. Uh, God said, you're going to Egypt. It was then that Moses faced his own uncertain tomorrow. After all, how could he return to Egypt after everyone knew that he had killed somebody there? Chapter 2, verse 14. Would he too be killed upon his returning? Well, that was unknown. We don't know what a day holds. He didn't know what was going on, if he would be killed or not. With this in mind, how do you and I face tomorrow? How do you and I face tomorrow? I got a letter from IRS this week. And it had IRS on there. And before I move the car, after stopping at the box, I'm opening this dude up. I am. You know what? You don't know. You're always like, you're on the edge. You're on the edge. And, you know, and <sighs> wow. But, oh, mighty God, he is faithful. He is good. Consider this. 
Moses could face uncertainty because he was assured like this, like us, that God, God is with him. He could face uncertainty because God is with him. Verses 11 and 12. Moses responded to the question, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Verse number 11. God immediately responds with an affirmation, I will certainly be with you. Well, if God is the same then as he is today, it's the same God. It's the same God that created everything. It's the same God that allowed you to be birthed. It's the same God that takes care of our needs every day. He's the same God. And if you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then every, every move that we make, every decision that we take, every door that we walk through, if we have prayed about it and we've given it to God, God's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of you. You see, God said, you're going to go. I guess Moses could have could have bared down and said, well, no, I'm not going to go, but I don't think that would have been good for Moses, do you? God said, you're going to go, but look, Moses, I'm going to be with you. Right there at the burning bush, folks. God showed up right there at the burning bush and showed him infallible proofs as to who God really is. He is God, the same God. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, I will, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we today in 2021, we today, we can say with confidence, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man will do to me. I will not fear. Psalms 118, verse number 6. We're certainly, we f we're facing uncertain times, but we are never alone because God is with us. God is with Emmanuel. Is that right? Emmanuel? Is that God with us? Is that the same God that you serve? Is that, if there's only one God, Amen. That God said, uh, said over 2,000 years ago that he loved you and I so much that he was going to send his only begotten son, and he came. And we have reference. Uh, we have material, his word, the living, powerful word of God that he gave us, his love letter, and he said, this is how you can survive. This is how you can live. This is how you can overcome the adversary. Do you want to overcome? Or do you, want to, do you just want to live in your muck? Do you want to live in, in the muck that we live in and, and, and we, just, we just kind of go by, about our day and, oh, everything is so negative, negative, negative. That's all I hear. And even when I go home sometimes, I, I, I do this to my wife. I'm not listening. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. You know, praise God. We can face uncertain times, Brother Wayne. And we can make it. We can make it. Moses was facing, he was facing a shakeup in his life. Well, I, you know, I always think about some things and I always think about life, what if? You know, I was in the military a few years, and I always think about what, I always thought about what war would be. I spent a little over nine years in the military, and I didn't have to see a day of war, and I could have spent 20 years in the military uh, during that time frame that I was in and probably never seen a day of war. Well, war is real. And we have enemies. We have enemies we have the enemy, but we have enemies 
that don't like America. And what would happen? I mean, my goodness, what would really happen if we really, if something happened here in America? Well, you know, whether we know it or not, things are happening in America. And that's more reason for us to, to draw closer and having a tighter relationship with the Lord, don't you think? Because I'm going to tell you, if, if per se, if they take away this or if they take away that, or if this happens, if, you know, I would, I would freeze to death if I had to live out there on the street like some of our folks out at 12th Street. I would freeze. You would too, probably. We're so used to our, our comfort. We have so much. We have so much. I have, uh, I have three vehicles in my yard. One of them's broken down. It's got a bad transmission, but I still got other vehicles that I can drive. And I've been driving the, the church van out here for a while, trying to put a few miles on it. But, you know, we've got so much. Churches, we've got so much. In the very day that this church right here, back way back in 1860, and they would maybe raise the windows up to have flowing air or have the pot-bellied heater right here in front to, to put out a little bit of heat. If somebody had to walk to church today, maybe, uh, maybe 500 yards or whatever, you know, I don't know, they probably wouldn't even come. We've got so much to be thankful for. We do. But God was going to make it personal with Moses. Verses 13 through 15. You see, Moses still was not convinced. Moses asked God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? In verse 13, God responded to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you say to them, I am has sent you. Now, it sounds odd for Moses to ask God, what about your name, God? What is your name? But he did. You see, names are not a big deal today, but they were. In biblical days, they meant, they meant, they meant much about the person and about the person's ministry. Moses may have, uh, have been checking to see if God could deliver if he returned to Egypt. And God stamped his name as a promise. The reference, I am, is actually Yahweh in the Hebrew. Based on the promise of God, the best working definition for Yahweh is is this right here. Now, I looked through a lot, of, a lot of different ones, and this is the one that I chose to bring today. It means I will always be what I have always been. That is God. I will always be what I have always been. God mentions Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He does this to remind Moses, the Israelites, and us that just as he delivered those heroes of faith in the past, he also hears our prayers today. You see, I just want to close. I want to close with a thought. God is... God is the one that will deliver us. God is the one that will keep us safe. God is the one that will, through the storm, will carry us all the way. He is faithful. He is dependable. He is God. I am. Centuries later, Jesus would take the name I am and complete it. You see, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And Jesus is the one who is making 
intercession for you that's in glory right now. Let's face it. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. Sometimes we don't come across just right. But Jesus is right there praying. He's right there with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. Let's all stand together, every head bowed and every eye closed just for a minute. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that as we come today, Father, to, to basically a, well, a break here in the message maybe, maybe a conclusion. But Father, as we've looked at the life of Moses for a short little while, Father, I'm thankful for, for Moses. I'm thankful. And I know Moses just like I know us. Moses was out there where he was at taking care of business and living his life and enjoying his family. Father, I thank you for the life, that, for the illustration that you have given us today. That God, we know that we're going to be, in the world we're going to have tribulation. But Lord, we're to be of good cheer because you have overcome the world. And Father, we come to you today, Lord. And Father, we thank you, Father, for the message today. And Lord, for the invitation, Father, even right now, as, Father, as we come and we ask folks to move, we pray right now, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, that, God, as you've spoken to our heart, God, if we need you as our Savior, and, God, I pray that today would be the day. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you need Jesus as your Savior, this invitation is for you. If you desire to come to the altar today to pray for your family, pray for a loved one, pray for a need, why don't you come and why don't you come and just take that time and, and just spend right here at the altar? The altar is a special place. There are X's marked all over where we can socially distance, but come. If God has spoken to you, come and get around the altar. Maybe even pray for our great nation. Heavenly Father, I do thank you and I do praise you for our church. In Jesus' name, amen. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner be still the earth has no sorrow the heaven can't heal the earth has no sorrow the heaven can't heal to lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh,
Praise God. Uh, just before we go to Sunday school today, just want to mention that, uh, like I said, some classes are going back to their room, stuff like that. Let's please now, I am concerned about everybody being in the classes. Our Sunday school director is also concerned. We need to be concerned. Uh, if we can't pack too many people in a class. So, so if I come around to the class there and I see too many people there, I may ask you to go to a larger room, okay? We may have to do something. We may have to shift or whatever. So please help me to help you. To let's help each other uh, to know that we can we can do this. We're going to do this, and it's going to be okay. I believe that we can have church. I believe that we can have Sunday school. I believe we can have discipleship training. I believe that we can have it all. I believe, but we just gotta. You know, we've been going for, through this for a little while, so we know we've learned a little bit. Okay, but anyway, uh, I want to ask you to do something else. Now, listen, I have I have gallons. I have five-gallon buckets of corn syrup back in the back back there. I do. Uh -huh. It came from Alabama about five or six months ago. But uh, what I would like to be able to do with that, I would like to, and I will, I will take, if, if I have some quart jars, what I'm asking for, I know that we can. We do stuff like that. I've got probably 20 or 30 at the house that I can bring. I would like to, if you would, if you have some that you would like to donate to the cause, I'll buy the lids, you know, stuff like that. I would like to take this stuff in a bucket and pour it in a jar, clean it up real good, slap a label on there, use it as a testifying, uh, something that we can give somebody, you know, something like that, and be able to go around or be able to have, you know, we give bread. I brought potatoes in last week. I bring sweets in, stuff like that. Hey, I'd like to be able to minister like this. So if you if you have something that you'd like to donate, uh, bring those jars. If you'd like to wash them up in the dishwasher, it'd be great for me. That means that I wouldn't have to take care of that, okay? But uh, probably on a Saturday, probably on a Saturday or maybe a Monday might be best for me is to have them back here, and I'll just start doing that, you know, and all. And listen, there are Rice Krispies that's in a box like this. There are 20 pounds, and I've got about five or six boxes, okay? And if somebody would like to make some treats for the kids, for the youth, my goodness, get some marshmallows and all that stuff like that. Just do it all up. I mean, they're back there. I have all that. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Real quickly, real quickly, uh, be much in prayer, as we've mentioned, Ben. And all the family. Curtis Langerm, I talked to him yesterday. His mother recently had, uh, a couple of weeks ago, had open heart surgery. She's doing good and home. But uh, be much in prayer for her. The Alex Phillips family, uh, Brother Lynn and myself, was over there yesterday. And we spent time the week before I was over there. And uh, But Brother Alex went on to be with the Lord God called him home, so please be in prayer for his wife and uh, Junior and all the family. Would you do that? Pastor Search Committee, our church, our country, the Sunday school classes as we start back today, Miss Cornelia Whitaker, Larry Slover. I think Larry is probably, I don't know whether he's back home, but he, he may be in transit even today. I don't know, but he, he's coming home shortly anyway. Pray for him. Linda Miller. So we hadn't seen Linda Miller here in a while either. Uh, be much in prayer for her. Uh, uh, Shannon Green. I uh, talked to uh, Donald a couple of days ago about Shannon. She's getting better, but still remember to pray for her. Uh, Brooke Harris. 
Uh, Brooke was not able to be here this morning. Her heart rate fluttering, kind of thing like that. So y'all be much in prayer for her. Uh, the Bob Bolin family, y'all be much in prayer for that family also in the loss of a family member, okay? Is there anybody else that we'd like to add from this side over here real quickly, quickly? All right, how about this side right here? Okay, this side right here. Okay, we're good. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, amen, amen. All right, all right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll go to Sunday school. Father, again, how we thank you for this time together, how we thank you for your wonderful love, how we thank you for the services, the doors being open here, Father. And, Father, I thank you for Chrissy, Father, as she comes and, uh, and, and, uh, and cleans and takes care and sanitizes. And our Sunday school teachers, Father, how they're going to help out in that way, Father, also. We just ask for your blessings for Sunday school hour and then our church services tonight, Father. And uh, we just ask for your help, God, and, and be with all of our family that's sick and all of those that are hurting. In Jesus' name, amen.